Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this special occasion. My name is Simeon Dagas, and I'm the Provost of Chief Academic Director <coughs> of St. Mary's University. And this is one of a, a series of inaugural lectures that will take place this year, but also at the beginning of the next academic year. And I think I was asking the question earlier, actually, to Charlie and a few other people we have tomorrow and the day after in Lego. When was the time that we confirmed you? And actually, it was about two years ago, but only during the pandemic. So we still have a lot of catch-up to do with this type of, 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 of events. Um, and I always say uh, inaugural lectures is the best time to talk about your passion your research to your family without being interrupted <laughs> <laughs> and without them actually losing interest or leaving the room and it is fascinating to have your family your parents your children here about everyone around here to actually listen for you for 45 minutes talking about your passion it's really incredible so we are here today for Professor Charlie Pedler and his inaugural lecture. As a sports sociologist, this sounds a bit Greek to me, even though I'm Greek by descent. <laughs> However, I'm sure that Charlie will give us a very, very, very good 45 minutes of good knowledge and understanding in his field of expertise. When I moved to St. Mary's about five years ago, I did my own research around who oh, I am going to see, you know, newly dean, new faculty. I need to know a bit more about these people. And there are about six, seven names that I were really stand up. And one of them was actually Charlie. And I remember back then he was in America. So I was listening to this Charlie Pedler, really prolific researcher, huge amount of income coming in, publications from here all the way to the Waldegrave room when we were actually going to walk. I said, we're not going to see this person. Is this person actually real? But actually he was real. He came back from America and we had first conversation in a very little boxy room that I had somewhere there around, so what's the plan for next year? And he was like, I do every year. Which is, I'm going to publish, I'm going to bring some income. Yeah, can we have a little plan around that? No, I asked for that plan before, but I'm very happy to do it. So that was my first interaction with Charlie. And of course, you know, we all know Charlie. Here. But Charlie is also a big, big scholar in his field of study. Nine publications plus, some great connections around the world. Funding, I mean, I have at least about 16 here. So I'm just going to stick to a few. FIFA, the Irish Research Council, the Royal Ballet, the Ministry of Defence, Parkland recently, and it has been an incredible funding this because actually it talks more around the notion of health and the intersection with performance and how we get people more involved with physical activity. So I think I'm going to stop here. I only have five minutes anyway and I, don't talk, I tend to talk a lot. So if you can actually join me in welcoming Professor Charlie Pedro. Wow, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, it's uh, quite overwhelming actually to see all these, all these faces looking at me and I'm just uh, really grateful for the introduction. Simeon, thank you very much. And I'm really grateful that everybody's come along, made the journey from quite far and wide uh, to, be, to be here with me today. So it's really, um, I'm really chuffed, chuffed a bit. So thank you very much. Um, there's lots of friends and family here and I hope, hopefully you'll join us for some food and drink afterwards over in the uh, Waldegrave uh, suite and uh, we can have a, a proper catch up. But it's the first time I think I've actually lectured my, my parents <laughs> and, uh, and actually they probably lectured me a fair bit, but it wasn't really that kind of upbringing. I didn't feel like I'm, you know, we're, we're turning the tables or anything, but um, my big sister on the other hand, maybe. Uh, <laughs> But um, my dad always, say, always said, you know, when you're preparing a, uh, a talk or preparing a, uh, an essay, say what you're going to say. 
uh, say it and then say what you've said. Uh, so, uh, I'll, uh, well, here goes. So what I'm going to talk about is what I'm really interested in, which is um, really the long-term health of the athlete. And I think uh, sports science has been a fantastic career so far. It's just the beginning, hopefully. Um, but it's been a great career or a great subject to kind of um, to study um, to learn about health, learn about stress, learn about long-term um, long effects of, of training and, and performance. Um, and athletes are always kind of treading that fine line between how far they can push themselves, a bit like Icarus, how, how close to the sun could, could Icarus fly before, before the wings got burnt, and um, trying to maintain the right balance of training and recovery is one of the hardest things that athletes have to do. Um, if they do get it wrong, they end up sick and injured and then they can't perform at all. So it's a really interesting, concentrated period of stress, if you like, that um, helps us to learn um, a lot about how to stay healthy, how to, how to perform. Ooh, I've gone on a little bit far there, sorry. So um, my talk is split into five sections. So you can keep track. I'm going to jump around a little bit because, you know, it's really a helicopter view of each of these different areas because there's not a lot of time to go uh, to go into everything. Um, but these are some of my favorite areas to talk about. And, and with the help of many uh, friends and colleagues, uh, we've managed we've managed to make small research contributions over the years in these in these areas. Um, the first section is about sport and stress and, and some of the frameworks that we use to help think about how we can manage this uh, stress and recovery. So let's start thinking about sport and um, this is uh, this is our most uh, successful winter athlete or certainly uh, alpine skier. Uh, she's a local friend of St Mary's and, and you might have seen her, well, her names on the on a plaque outside the door. She actually opened this facility almost 10 years ago. Um, anyway this is a picture of her on the way to the shops in in Twickenham. Um, uh, no, she's She's actually broken 49 um, bones in her body over her career, um, which just tells you something about the mentality of these athletes, that they're willing to not just injure themselves once, but do it again and again and again, and put themselves in harm's way um, in, in, in order to continue to achieve their goals. And there's many examples of this, of course, across, across sport, but also people and their general ambitions, you know, they're willing to put their health on the line in order to achieve, not just in the sphere of, of athletics. Um, sadly, these two athletes um, will be missing the World Cup this year just because of the probably one of the cruelest injuries, which is the ACL rupture. And uh, these seemingly happen out of the blue, these injuries, but um, seems to be a combination between, uh, you know, an, an abrupt movement of some kind, but also something to do with the physiological state of the athlete. And there's a lot more research is needed um, in, in this space to, to avoid these kind of uh, injuries, which take an entire season to to recover from so um, yeah a lot more work is needed here another example is um, the ballet dancers that we work with uh, we have a long-standing relationship as two guys at the back over there just uh, done a lot of work in this in this uh, in this area Joe and and Adam and um, these photos credit to Adam for the photos but um, we have a long-standing relationship with the Royal Ballet and we've been able to do some work documenting their uh, injury records and um, produce some really nice quality outputs like this one, for example. And this specifically showed that injury incidents were higher when, when dancers were going from uh, moving in, into the early part of the season, uh, slightly lower during the mid-season, but then higher again towards the end. So there's something about initially changing the, the workload, then adapting to the workload, but then also um, uh, the fatigue that can set in when we try to perform at a high level week after week after week. So a high pr proportion of these injuries were, were overuse in nature um, and a common mechanism in this group specifically. I mean, you can see the phenomenal athleticism of these, uh, of these dancers, but common, uh, to the, a common mechanism seems to be jumping and landing and the stresses they put particularly on the, on the lower limbs um, during this uh, this, these performances. Um, but there's another kind of injury as well that's not so obvious how it might happen and this is the more longer term um, illnesses that 
uh, more like a sort of slow burn uh, illness uh, relating to overuse and fatigue. And it's often difficult to define. We use terms like overtraining, um, uh, unexplained underperformance syndrome, and then relative energy deficiency in, in sport, mental health illnesses that can be much slower to come to uh, fruition and they can be characterized by a whole constellation of symptoms. It's very hard to pin down what's the cause and what's the uh, diagnosis. If we can get training right and achieve the right training balance, so the, uh, the stimulus and the, and the recovery, and we can do that over and over again, we can protect ourselves to some extent and grow, grow in confidence, grow in strength to perform well. Uh, and that's what, um, that's what helps us to do that, which I'm gonna come on to now. So going back to 1950 and a guy called Hans Sale pictured here, uh, looking the part with his lab coat and his pipe and his, uh, and his microscope. Um, publishing in the British Journal of Medicine in, in uh, 1950, talked about uh, the general adaptation syndrome. This was often misquoted as the general adaptation theory, but importantly, it's a syndrome um, which helped to explain how st stresses, uh, how we adapt to stresses, and then how, uh, if we carry on with those stresses for too long, we end up in this exhausted state. So briefly, there are three phases to this model. Uh, there's the initial shock and then the counter shock where we adjust our homeostasis um, and we're quite vulnerable at that point where we're kind of in our fight or flight uh, uh, stage but then we restore our, our homeostasis and if we do this uh, continuously or if we have the right conditions we can then develop a, a tolerance or resistance to that, uh, to that adaptation or to that, um, or to that stressor. There's a third phase that's often overlooked, which is then this exhaustion phase. And this is about how long can we actually keep tolerating this stress before we actually end up in this exhausted state. And sometimes, you know, this can be really severe and we need medical support to bring us back. Sometimes it's uh, some kind of um, uh, more minor issue that stops us training, but allows us to, to get back uh, and, and, well, uh, and, and recover. So this is obviously a disease type model, um, but it does apply quite nicely to sport. If we take a look now at how it looks in, in sport, we have uh, this general kind of um, uh, model that you see in any sports science textbook. Many sports science lectures start with this kind of uh, model where we initially cause a, a damage. Look at those red arrows just like at the opticians. I have to line them up, but, they, but we've got our initial stressor uh, causing a depression in our function or our performance but then over time we get on this upward trajectory and our performance actually uh, improves. Um, it's kind of like having a free upgrade week on week you know why aren't we all doing this it's, in, it's incredible. So um, what does the stress response actually look like? Well it's orchestrated by the brain the brain is, is hugely important at, at, at controlling this, uh, this whole process. So my wife would say this talk is about psychology. Of course, of course she would. Um, so centrally mediated by the brain, uh, the stress response goes that we have what's called sympathetic outflow. So this is the central nervous system kicking in, doing its thing. And then a slightly longer term uh, mediator of this process, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis kicks in releases the hormones that we need to actually control this stress and, and adapt to the stress. And what we see at this point is actually damage. So we, need to, we sometimes need to cause uh, damage or be in an uncomfortable situation in order to actually uh, gain strength from it. So um, just about any system, if you train for hard enough for long enough, you can measure uh, damage. So damage to the heart, damage to the bones, we see increased bone turnover markers, even damage to the brain. So, um, so, but these are fine because we're going to then adapt to them. And it really importantly, we see resolution to the inflammation that's caused and adaptation. This is a critical step in this process. So over time we've become, we get closer to our genetic potential, um, which is, this is, this is the ideal scenario. And for an athlete, if you can do this successfully, you can then perform, take a break, and repeat. And it's a wonderful model of, uh, of adaptation and, and performance. But obviously, there's a big gap in my slide here where things can actually uh, not go that way. They, we actually end up with a downward trajectory. 
um, and a reduced performance over time, which is this fatigued state that I'm talking about. At that point, we might end up with a force break. It might be an injury that forces us to stop an illness. Uh, we might have um, underperformance. Um, and this is really a, a pathological path or pathophysiological state in that, in that we, um, we end up with a, a, an adverse negative outcome. So why does this happen? Well, um, it could be that there's too much of a stress um, and our, um, the, sorry, there's not enough of a stress, not enough of a stimulus and the, and the stress response is inadequate. It could be that we have too many stresses all happening at once and too frequently. And so we can't, um, we can't tolerate that amount of stress. There might be a failure to actually switch off that sympathetic nervous system response. So we end up in a really uh, pumped up, switched on state the whole time, can't relax, can't switch off, can't adapt to the training. So there's another model which I think I've been reading a lot about recently called allostasis. So we've probably heard of homeostasis. This is what keeps our body temperature in a nice stable level, blood sugar, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Well, if we think, um, if we think another level, um, which is um, allostasis, this is about achieving stability through these change, through these uh, through these changes. So dealing with the stresses that. That, that come along. Think about all the things that we're carrying in our heads, the baggage that we carry in our heads in terms of not having enough sleep, not, um, you know, uh, family issues, like whatever it might be, training load. We, we're still able to function, but we have this, uh, what's called allostasis. And this is, a, this is a framework that comes from neuroendocrinology, which helps us explain, actually, again, a disease model, helps us to, helps us to explain how uh, we can end up in this disease state. So there's many, many different stresses in this uh, in this big triangle here. Uh, each one has a kind of optimal dose response. So we have the right amount of exercise, the right amount of sleep, the right quality of food, all help us to stay in this uh, in, in this uh, with this ability to to um, to tolerate this uh, this stress. Too much of any of these things, and we could uh, we could end up um, with um, numerous physiological systems being uh, activated that actually then end up uh, leading to disease. So um, I think there's quite a nice fit with this type of allostasis model and sport. So when we come to back to our, um, our fatigued athlete here, I'm going to come back to those terms in a second, we have this period here which I'm going to just put this new term against. Uh, sports allostasis, where um, it sort of mixes together the general adaptation theory with allostasis, because I think maintaining a athletic phenotype actually is a stress in itself. And we know this because as soon as we take away the, the training load, we revert back to a, a, a lesser trained state. Much like servicing a very expensive car, it takes time, money, the insurance is expensive, it needs special fuel. It, in, in, uh, on a human level, that means we have to make sacrifices in order to keep the athlete in this top shape. So athletes don't tend to go out so much. They don't tend to drink alcohol. They have to do all of these things in order to keep in this, in this, uh, in this uh, higher level of peak performance. So I'm going to run through a few of these different stresses and just some of the things that we've done to, uh, to hopefully find solutions. But... Um, and you'll begin to build up a picture of uh, the type of um, allostasis or allost allostatic load that I'm, that I'm talking about. So the first one is training load. And athletes, I love this, I love this uh, uh, cartoon because it just illustrates perfectly like sports that have massive training volumes like rowing, swimming, uh, cycling and running. Given the chance, athletes will train a lot more than they, they need to. And even just subtly giving them a break here. Uh, at uh, 6.30 p.m., they'll choose to do aerobics anyway. So they won't necessarily take a, a, a full break from, from their sport. So the role of the sports scientist here is, is uh, or a useful role of the sports scientist, is to help monitor training load. And that often means uh, telling athletes to do a little bit less and get the recovery balance, uh, training and recovery balance right. They might do things like monitor um, monitor the heart rate, monitor heart rate variability, monitor um, their, their, um, their workload, monitor their sleep. Um, and we might ask them, 
how well they're fe how they're feeling are they feeling well recovered um, and there's obviously now a plethora of devices and gadgets that will help give them feedback um, that can sort of drown them in, in, in data if we're not careful. It could even be an additional cause of, of stress. So this is a, a good role for, for the sports scientist. And one of the things I just want to touch on is our work around um, blood biomarker monitoring. I can't go into a lot of detail because it's just going to take way too long, but we've developed um, research and, and techniques around taking very small amounts of, of blood in order to measure um, oxidative stress. And this is this is my colleague Nathan Lewis, who's uh, a long long term friend of mine, and we've we've produced several um, publications together. But Nathan's an absolute genius when it comes to um, a lot of this stuff, and um, he's developed um, a system essentially for um, tracking load via um, point of care blood tests, um, specifically looking around oxidative stress. So this idea that there's an optimum stress. Um, that you can achieve through this, the theory of hormesis here. Too much stress produces too much oxidative stress, too little, and we don't get enough um, adaptation. So the basic idea is to track the biomarkers over time, and we can see a relationship between the amount of stress and the uh, response in these biomarkers and help use that to keep athletes in a uh, healthy, um, adaptive state. So there's a publication there, that uh, one of many, that... Uh, demonstrates this in elite rowers, showing that, um, showing how these biomarkers shift according to loading and then how they relate to risk of injury, risk of illness occurring uh, uh, across a, a whole season in, in Olympic rowers. One really important thing that I like to talk about is, is the application of reference ranges, because how do you know if a data point is out of range or how do we know if it's, uh, if it's uh, healthy or okay for, for an athlete? And, Having lots more data points really helps us to do that. Uh, and what that can enable us to do is actually then apply these adaptive ranges. Um, similar to the athlete biological passport, where once you have a few data points on an individual, you can then develop a much more individualized, much narrower reference range. And this helps us to flag unusual data points that might be popping outside of that, of that range. So um, with Professor John Newell over in uh, University of Galway and uh, some of his students, we've been able to um, create uh, an adaptive range tool to where you can put any data in and create this, um, this um, individualized adaptive range. Okay, that's enough about biomarkers, but if you want to read more about that, we've got a, a, a review there in sports medicine that says what we might measure in blood tests, wh why we might why measure it, and then how to do it uh, really well to get the maximum kind of benefit from that type of approach. Okay, changing tack slightly now um, to the cardiovascular system, which I, you know, this is where one of the areas w w which really started off my training, uh, University of Wolverhampton. Um, and uh, I, you know, enjoy talking about it. We've got a few people in the room who know a lot about the cardiovascular system, so they'll be sniggering away at the back. But um, it's really quite a phenomenal piece of machinery if you take into account the integrated nature of uh, the cardiovascular system and how it helps us to maintain exercise output. So if you open a textbook, exercise physiology textbook, you get this kind of diagram which shows you this integrated system. And it's about transferring um, oxygen from the air all the way through to the mitochondria in the, in the, in the working musculature to produce the energy to, to move. Conversely, also removing carbon dioxide back through the system and back out and expiring that into it back into the atmosphere. So um, it's quite a remarkable uh, system when, we, when you think about it, because even going from lying down to standing up, we have lots of small adjustments to, to maintain the pressure in the system. When we go from rest to exercise, we, we see a, a humongous increase in the amount of um, uh, output of the system and, and the delivery of, of, of oxygen. So from around five liters um, per minute to around 40 liters per minute in the case of, a, of an endurance athlete. Um, so just focusing just briefly, first of all, the lungs, um, these are the most phenomenal bits of kit. If you think that it's a incredibly thin uh, blood gas barrier. So this is where the, to enable the maximum amount of exposure of the blood to the air. Um, so we have the largest surface area of any organ, external surface area in the, in the lungs. 
and we um, we even have surfactants on our on the surface of the the single cell uh, walls in the in the lungs that help to uh, to keep them open so the lungs don't collapse, but also patrol them for um, uh, infection. So there's a you know there's a, um, immune, an intricate immune system happening, and this, this responds dynamically to exercise. Also, macrophages in there that clear up any bits of debris that might get in, in there in terms of particulates and um, uh, allergens and, and, and so on that might get into the, into the lungs. Um, when we start to move through the system here, so the, the main pumping mechanism is the heart and it, it goes hand in hand with the blood volume. And this is absolutely crucial for maintaining blood pressure, maintaining uh, this transport uh, system. I'm going to come on to that a little bit more, but um, this is, I find this diagram really useful. Um, Aaron Bagish published this one in, in, um, back in 2012, but it just illustrates really nicely how the key components of the, the heart, the left ventricle, ventricle and the right ventricle, so the, the image at the top here, really simplified image of the, of the heart. Um, the left ventricle here is the main component that actually pumps blood around the body, around to the working musculature. And we can see on the bottom, bottom, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but yeah, um, the bottom here, the, the thickening of the left ventricular uh, muscle wall and also dilation of that cavity. This is the volume trained heart. So in the endurance type of exercise that the likes of Steph and Andy Badley's out there somewhere, um, you know, they can maintain phenomenal work outputs for, for long periods of time. And part of the reason they can do that is that they can actually, the, the heart can actually process a huge volume of, of blood. When we do strength training, we also get an adaptation to the heart, but it's, but it's a pressure adaptation. So we get the thickening, but we don't have this high throughput of volume that's needed to sustain high intensity exercise. So incredible, again, the specificity that we have to adapt um, in order to um, perform in our, in our chosen sport. Not only that, just while we're talking about the heart, but the muscle fibers of the heart are actually uh, organized in such a way that they're diagonally uh, crossed over like this. Um, so that when, you, when the heart pumps, it actually twists as well. So it's actually wringing out uh, the blood to get maximum um, uh, cardiac output. And like I said before, as when we take away the stimulus, we take away the, the stressor, we actually see a reversal of this. So we were able to document the reverse process in um, Boston Marathon runners while I was over there um, on, a, on a research sabbatical. And you can see um, we start to lose um, muscle mass in that left ventricle after, after four weeks of detraining. We lose blood volume here in terms of the water component uh, and then gradually the, the, uh, uh, the red blood cells. There's one more part that I think is really exciting about the, about the cardiovascular system, and that's the skeletal muscle pump. So we mustn't forget this part, that actually when we, when we run, particularly, it does happen with other um, activities as well, but specifically during running, we, we have um, the musculature um, and, the, and, the, and the intricate network of valves push blood back to the heart and can actually increase the, uh, the capacity of the system by up to 60%, although that's really difficult to measure and is, and is, uh, and is perhaps uh, debated exactly what that contribution is. So sports scientists, sports physiologists will spend a lot of time um, in, or used to spend a lot of time in the lab. Today, a lot of the measurements can take place out in the field. We've got uh, accelerometers, we've got heart rate monitors, we've got all these gadgets. But um, it used to be that to get an insight into your physiology and how it was adapting, you'd regularly visit the lab uh, to get that kind of data. And we still do this. Um, the main thing that we're trying to measure here is the capacity of that whole system, uh, that whole integrated system. So there's three things that, that you might, three, three broad bits of data that we might look to, to get from, from the lab. One is the, the VO2 max, so that's the complete capacity of the, of the cardiovascular system to, uh, to consume oxygen. That's like the size of our aerobic engine. The metabolic thresholds, so without going into too much detail, the points that we shift from predominantly uh, aerobic, uh, highly sustainable, kind of fat, predominantly fat burning um, system through to a uh, much higher octane anaerobic uh, sugar burning system um, and then our economy so how 
ec economically can we actually move without so how, what's the oxygen cost of uh, of um, locomotion so the ideal adaptation for an endurance athlete is that we get a bigger capacity and we get a lower oxygen cost so we really um, become very efficient and we have much more capacity to uh, to increase our, our work output so VO2 max, I mentioned, is the size of this system. And you can see here there's a really, really strong correlation between VO2 max and the amount of hemoglobin that we have, the hemoglobin mass. And sadly, this is the reason why doping is so effective. And you, hear, you would have heard of Lance Armstrong putting, um, putting fresh blood into his, uh, back into his system because it gives him a direct increase in his, in his capacity. So this is properly cheating. It's, uh, it's audacious when you, when you think about it. But athletes will spend a lot of time trying to increase their hemoglobin mass through training um, and going to altitude, which I'll, which I'll come on to. Um, you can see here that, that this, with, with weeks of training, we get an, initially the, the blood volume increases via the water component. So we get this acute response that helps us to deliver more or helps the whole system to be more to be more efficient and and we get you know if you were to go out and do a long run uh, a day or two later you would actually you can almost feel the kind of blood volume is, ex is expanded if you're really tuned into your to your body but um, there's a longer there's a slower process that occurs over a number of weeks which is the then the release of new red blood cells uh, which takes much longer to occur um, that's this uh, this lower line here the mechanism, just very briefly behind that, is that you know you get this plasma volume expansion. It's the water component of the blood that reduces the amount of oxygen tension in the kidneys. We release a hormone called EPO, and that that produce, releases more red blood cells from the from the bone marrow. Um, and so again, another phenomenal component of our adaptability to to perform. Um, the uh, the next one I'm going to move on to in terms of the uh, different stresses here that make up this, this total load uh, is the environment. So I was very lucky in the early part of my career to go to altitude with a number of teams and actually um, work with athletes. I never went up as high as Everest. I mean, that was that we would never go there with athletes, but we would typically go to um, between 2,000 and 3,000 meters altitude. And remember that oxygen trying to take the oxygen from the air all the way through to the muscle well when you go up to high altitude the pressure is is lower such that the partial pressure of oxygen decreases and there's far less of a driver far less of a gradient to get the oxygen from the atmosphere through to the to the musculature so again it gives us a stimulus to increase our uh, epo production and um, naturally increase our red blood cells and our, and our hemoglobin mass um, just while we're on altitude this is uh, just, I just marvel at the early days of my career with, with Greg and, and Rich and Andy Lane uh, going up to altitude. This is Greg here um, going for a run on a glacier at 3,000 metres. You'll see that this, is, uh, this picture isn't very good quality. That's because I actually had slide film in my camera. Uh, so that shows how long ago this was now, which is pretty frightening compared to what you, what you see now. Um, but our challenge here was to uh, help acclimatise the some of the winter athletes for the Salt Lake City Olympics to, um, to altitude because they were gonna be performing at 1600 meters uh, in the Olympics. And they needed all the, um, all the help they could get to get maximum points to be able to, um, to qualify for the Olympics. And I, I was like, I don't know what the phrase is, um, boy in a candy shop or something, like traveling around altitude training venues um, around Europe. I, at one point I was the kind of go-to altitude guy and so I was away with speed skating in Italy and I was away in Canada and I was away at these amazing places. It was just mind-blowing the, the kind of the, uh, the thrill for me of doing this kind of, of work was, uh, was, it was incredible. Um, but what was really important was the, uh, the outcome from it and how we can, because altitude is a stressor, what, how can we navigate that process of athletes going from sea level into the hypoxia altitude um, and then coming back down again and being able to perform without overloading them and without this becoming a stressor that was intolerable, thinking about that total load. And so we would come up with um, 
advice for these teams. We come up with measurements to take and, you know, these kind of checklists of how, if you're going to do altitude, let's do it well and let's, uh, let's try and get the best possible um, outcomes from the altitude training. So still kind of, so altitude is a stimulus for, the, uh, for this joined up cardiovascular system in terms of the blood volume. Another important part of that, and this is where we move on to nutrient and energy deficiency, is uh, iron. So iron, if you look into the red blood cells, they're packed full of hemoglobin. And the main component of that hemoglobin is iron. And we get that from, uh, we get that from iron in our, in our, in our diet, um, predominantly from, or the, the best source is from heme iron, but also non-heme iron. And um, just a few things about, about, uh, about that, that here. So um, in order to create these red blood cells, packed full of hemoglobin, we need iron, we need B12, we also need folate. So deficiencies in any of these will, will reduce our ability to produce new red blood cells. Men need about eight milligrams per day and postmenopausal women need about eight milligrams per day of, of iron, whereas women um, more like 18 milligrams because of um, blood losses through the menstrual cycle. And that goes up during pregnancy. So it's, uh, iron is really, really important for, the, for that, uh, that phase and importantly we have no real mechanism for excreting our end so it's once we get it into our system it's kind of um it's kind of there to stay and so in order to protect ourselves from iron overload because we can't easily get rid of it we have um a peptide hormone called hepcidin which um, helps us to control the iron absorption so this is really really important because um if we, if we just let the body absorb as much iron as, as we want, we get iron build up in the body and that would be, um, lead to various disease states. But hepcidin helps us control that. So we've got this intricate mechanism for actually protecting us from iron overload. When we become iron deficient or when we go into a low oxygen environment, then the hepcidin uh, goes down and helps us to absorb more iron. When we have iron excess or when we're in an inflamed state, hepcidin goes up to stop us from uh, absorbing too much iron. And this, is, this can be a problem for athletes because they're constantly going through cycles of inflammation and resolution. So they can't always take on the iron that they want to from the gut. So what hepcidin does is actually uh, shuts down these things called, um, fer uh, called um, uh, ferroportin, these uh, channels that, where we actually absorb the iron, get, get closed down. And, and we can't actually uh, consume any more iron. So um, we produced a paper in 2018 that went through some of the touch points uh, through the, through a, of, for different scenarios that might happen to athletes. For example, uh, 12 weeks of, of heavy training, um, uh, the menstrual cycle, going to altitude. These are all times where you might, might need more iron. So they represent windows of of risk of iron deficiency. Um, so the, I, I suppose that I, I'm talking about iron because I think it's an important um, component of the, of the uh, for the production of red blood cells and the maintenance of the um, and the maintenance of this uh, cardiovascular system. And so um, it represents if we have an iron deficiency, it represents another stressor on the athlete. So let's grab a quick drink. The next one I want to talk about is the, the female athlete, and this has been uh, an interesting journey for me. So I, I've been lucky enough to work with um, a lot of female athletes over the years. And when it came to actually, so we would do our, we would work with female athletes pretty much as we would work with male athletes. We wouldn't really take into account uh, the, uh, the menstrual cycle or any female athlete specific issues. Um, and, you know, occasionally an athlete would be on the treadmill in the lab and they would maybe complain that they've got some symptoms related to their period. Um, but we just say, OK, well, you know, you deal with that and we'll, we'll just, uh, you know, come back when you've got it sorted out. Um, which was really sort of not particularly helpful in the big scheme of things. And, and actually, it wasn't just me. When you look at the literature and the research around the female athlete, it's hugely skewed towards males. 
It's much simpler to test and, and, and do research in male athletes. It's cheaper, it's less complicated. Let's just study men. And so we end up with this big kind of body of knowledge that is applied uh, to women, but it's based on men. So um, that all changed. Um, uh, thanks primarily to my PhD student, Georgie, uh, who's a former PhD student, she's now an international uh, pioneer in this whole area and has done phenomenal, phenomenally well. And, and now uh, we've worked together with um, several, uh, a growing list of kind of, um, of successful athletes with the menstrual cycle and female health at the, at the center of that work. And that's really credit to Georgie and her team and a lot of the work that's, that's been done there um, that helps us to, to, to do that and really tailoring things towards the female athlete. I mean, I'm, I won't do this area justice, but I'm gonna try and explain a little bit about what we do there now. So the menstrual cycle, uh, very briefly, is characterized by these fluctuations in hormones. Of particular note is this uh, first sort of half of the cycle where we have a more estrogen dominant phase. Um, and then the second half more dominant uh, progesterone dominant phase with ovulation separating the two in the middle but look towards the bottom of the chart and this is the reason why this is happening is uh, the cyclical regeneration uh, of the endometrial lining in the cervix so um, at this point here if there's been no fertilization then uh, we we have a rapid decrease in these in these hormones and a shedding of this endometrial lining and this is a process of inflammation. It's a process of uh, hypoxia. So we, we have ischemia where there's no oxygen getting to this tissue to enable it to, uh, to be shed. It's really a, a process of breaking down before we start the whole cycle again um, to build up this, uh, this endometrium again. Um, and what's really um, important here is that this can lead to symptoms. So we can have symptoms that can compromise our training, can make us feel, can make athletes uh, dramatically change day to day in terms of um, their uh, ability or their desire to train. Um, and and um, numerous symptoms can arise as a result of this. So um, this is why menstrual cycle goes into my list of stresses that, um, that contribute to this allostatic load. Um, a paper that we did with, um, with Strava, published in British Journal of Sports Medicine, and actually Andy Badley helped to, to, uh, uh, to set this one up, um, working for Strava at the time. And uh, we were able to recruit a huge group of active women using, uh, using the Strava exercise app and capture all the symptoms that they would, or not all the symptoms, because there's a potentially an endless list of symptoms, but um, a long list of symptoms um, and ask them how that related to their to their training and their performance, um, and we could we came up with these um, with some statistical modelling. We came up with these uh, these graphs here to show that the, the 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 probability of missing training, missing an event, uh, the probability of using copious amounts of of, of painkillers, um, and um, you know, was, was related to the number of symptoms that were being, um, that were being experienced. So um, it's really highlighted really clearly this relationship and that if we can help athletes to avoid these symptoms, um, we can actually help them to keep training, um, keep training more effectively. Um, and really the premise behind our work with female athletes has been to try to do this through uh, natural means, so avoiding taking non steroidal anti-inflammatories, avoiding athletes deciding to go on the pill to control these symptoms, and actually adjusting training where you need to, adjusting your diet where you need to, um, and you know, other strategies that we might be able to employ to help modify these symptoms. We've also found that where you can educate athletes, they often don't know anything about this because they haven't really had that opportunity to talk to people. They don't tend to talk to their coach about it, um, they don't talk to their teachers, they don't even tend to talk to their parents much about it. And um, not in every case, obviously. Um, but where we can uh, educate younger athletes, we can potentially help them not only with their careers, but also um, throughout their, their life. Because um, the menstrual cycle, we think of it, we see that one diagram as a single thing that happens. But obviously this happens over and over again, and actually 450 times across uh, across a... Um, a, a, an athlete's career and beyond. 
So, like I say, if we can get this right, then you can potentially be, it can potentially be really life-changing across, across time. I want to highlight, just put Georgie in the, in the, in the, and her team in the, in the spotlight a little bit more. I want to highlight the amazing work going on at uh, Chelsea uh, with the women's team over there. And they've had phenomenal success recently. If you follow women's football, you, you, you will know about that. Um, there's a picture of Georgie. Um, but the, some, of the, some of the theory behind this program is to normalize uh, the discussion. So make it okay to sort of talk about the menstrual cycle, talk about how it might be impacting training, create a safe space to do that. So, um, you know, you don't, you don't have to. It's an, it's an important point that there'll be many athletes that are not interested in talking about this and, don't, and that seemingly are not affected, but there are many that are affected uh, significantly. So um, creating that safe space is important in order to um, be able to discuss this and come up with strategies. Tracking the cycle, tracking symptoms is, is hugely important so you can get a picture of what's going on and actually notice the pattern, um, that, that, the phases that I uh, tried to get across in that first diagram. Um, menstrual cycle symptoms might be happening uh, on a, the same small number of days each cycle. And then individualise the support. So um, providing strategies that work for that individual. And it might be that there's different training options on different days rather than everybody just doing the same thing like they have to on match day. So you don't have to do all the same thing in training every day. Um, and perhaps if you adjust training, you'll be better able to perform on match day when you do have to. And really reframing the menstrual cycle about, you know, not being a negative issue, but being a superpower. And that's like, you know, I can hear that in my head from the, the, the team over there, the female athlete team. Um, in that this can really be something that you can, like it's a, it's a vital sign, it's a good sign of, of health um, to have a normal menstrual cycle. And it can be something that you can really use to your advantage if you learn to work with it rather than um, against it. So it's interesting as well, just to take a quick look, we've done some analysis of the Chelsea uh, injury data. And this is one of the very few studies, surprisingly, to uh, not published yet, but uh, to actually look at injury records alongside menstrual cycle data and show that we have a higher uh, frequency of uh, muscle injuries occurring uh, towards the end of the, or in the second half of the, uh, of, the, of the cycle, specifically in phase four. So this is um, the physio Ali Barlow over at Chelsea who's, who's been analysing these data, collecting and analysing a lot of these data and we're hoping to publish that one um, at some point. But what we've done is, is, is also, and what Georgie has done, is demonstrating a kind of a new role, if you like, for uh, within the sports science team for this female athlete lead. And you can see here, this, this is quite a, a niche role, but it, you need to communicate with the medical side because there's lots of medical issues that come up with this kind of uh, approach, but also then the multidisciplinary support team. So what the strategies might be that are going to help each athlete. And also for younger athletes, obviously, where necessary, involving um, parents for clinical issues uh, involving gynaecologists and, and so on. So just one more thing to say on that is that so far Chelsea have won three FA Cups in, in a row, four WSL league wins in a row. And that corresponds with the time that Georgie's been working with them. And, and so far, touch wood, everybody, no ACL injuries um, for three years. So like, that might just be... There's not, I can't demonstrate cause and effect, but there's definitely a pattern there. And I think if we can get this right, this is really pioneering a new way forward in, in, uh, in uh, helping female athletes to, uh, and avoiding those, those terrible injuries. So I just want to talk a little bit about energy deficiency as well, because this is something that comes up a lot. And when, when, we, when we lose the menstrual cycle, um, and this is a study that is kind of, it's just illustrative, really. It's kind of also um, a bit uh, frustrating because... What you're looking at here is two, uh, two different types of athletes. On, the, on the, this side here, on the left side, uh, these are uh, regularly cycling their, uh, those, those uh, female hormones. The ones on the right are flatlining due to an energy deficiency. So this is a retrospective analysis, uh, but nevertheless, the entire time through the study, they were uh, flatlining on these, on, these, on these hormones. And there's, there's five that were cycling regularly, five that were, were flatlining. Uh, it's a very neat study. They showed, the, they showed a difference in the energy balance between these two groups. They did the same training program and then 
this was the performance outcome. You can just about make out that the, the black dots there are the ones that were energy replete and had the regular cycle. They adapted well and were able to swim faster at the end versus the group that actually couldn't and got worse were the ones that had this, this flat line. And this was attributed to um, energy deficiency. But what it does is it paints a picture that is very much uh, binary from being energy replete to being energy deficient. And it also ignores other things that might be causing this flat line in, in, um, in, these, in these hormones. So what we know is, is it's a, a continuum from a healthy regular cycle uh, of, uh, anyway, uh, normal uh, menstrual cycle length uh, all the way through to the absence of a cycle, which is, is defined as, a, as, as no menstrual cycle for longer than, uh, than 90 days. In reality, when you start tracking menstrual cycle length, and this is a case study from, uh, from football here, uh, you get variations in menstrual cycle length. And so you can quite quickly see if, length, if menstrual cycle length is extending. Um, and so the thresholds I've put on here are uh, for that normal, uh, what we call eumenorrheic uh, cycle. And you can see occasionally it goes outside of that, but there's this median line I've put through here to show what might be normal for this particular athlete. We also add um, way up here is that amenorrheic. So think about those flat lined swimmers. Uh, who've you know gone 90 days without a, um, a menstrual cycle. So by tracking menstrual cycle length, a really simple thing to do, we might be able to help keep athletes in uh, this healthy range or keep this menstrual cycle going, which might help with energy balance uh, and uh, might be related to their, their stress as well. What's really fascinating is when, you, is when you start to layer on top of this other contextual information. So you can see, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but you can see this particular phase through here, for example, where we get to this red part. This is where um, workload was uh, increasing um, and it led to um, uh, a period of fatigue uh, and injury. And you can see uh, menstrual cycle length has gone off the median line here and has, gone, has increased and increased, um, touching on this oligomenorrheic line. And then with, with rest and recovery, very tightly managed training load before the Euros, it dips back down again. And then going to the Euros, imagine all the stress, imagine all of the excitement around the, 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 for the Lionesses at the Euros, uh, and we see a menstrual cycle extension again. So we can use this type of really simple information to help uh, understand what stresses there are on our team. And there's almost always a cause for it. So here's another example. COVID and uh, injuries here causing a, an extension of the, of the cycle. So the context is hugely important behind any of these data sets. You can see also there's massive individual variability in what these uh, tracking uh, menstrual cycle length charts look like. And there's, uh, there's periods where we have uh, really variable data and then uh, really uh, stable data. And so the, this is you know, really quite insightful. I'm going to stop talking about that now because you could probably go on a bit too long, but I think uh, there's a whole book chapter that uh, Georgie and I have written um, around uh, all the different factors that contribute to menstrual cycle characteristics, which is um, maybe worth a look. Final area I'm going to talk about is uh, sleep, another pet sort of subject of mine that's uh, really of interest and, and uh, I love sleeping, um, but also, it's also fundamental to, um, to health. So um, let's take a look at why we might sleep. Sleep is restorative for the brain. Um, it helps us consolidate memory and learning. You actually re uh, rehearse some of the things that you do during the day during your sleep to help consolidate them into, into memory. Crucial for athletes trying to learn uh, technical skills. Um, it's antioxidant, it's anti-inflammatory, it's anabolic, which means it's a time when we release uh, growth hormones and we can actually adapt and, and adjust uh, to, uh, to, the, to the training load. Essentially, it's essential. Um, and everybody needs to do it. Um, animals, remarkably dolphins sleep, um, they, but they, they're able to shut down one part of their brain, uh, put that to sleep, and then the other part, because if they went to sleep, they would stop swimming, which means they wouldn't be able to breathe, uh, come to the surface to breathe. So, so across the animal world we see, or certainly mammals, we see, uh, we see sleep occur occurring as a vital um, part of life. So um, 
when we lose sleep, and that's going to go into my uh, box here of, of, of things that contribute to this uh, allostatic load. And it's, what's interesting, I love this paper because it, it kind of keep going back to it because it really shows you how predictable the effects of sleep loss are on performance. So these are the results of a simple test, uh, these blue dots here going through these four data sets here. If you look, they all start with the same um, baseline here, which is normal sleep. And you can see you've got low values here um, indicating that the test results was the low errors, um, uh, reaction speed was good. Um, but when we take away sleep, so this one is three hours, we take away sleep, we see dramatic changes. And worryingly, this test is based on um, braking lights on the motorway. It's to simulate uh, uh, how quickly you react to, to, to brake lights turning on. Um, and you can see that when you, when you drop down to three hours of sleep, you see this dramatic and predictable change. Um, so this red line here is actually the, in this particular paper, they modeled what happens to sleep, uh, what happens to this test uh, when you lose sleep. With five hours sleep, you still see changes in this test, very, very sensitive to, to changes. Um, there's a couple of people in the room who have done a lot of work, Luke over there and, uh, and Paul as well, Paul Hoff. Um, but what's remarkable here is the, uh, the difference between seven hours and nine hours. So even there, there's a detectable difference. So it takes a lot of restorative sleep to be able to perform mentally at our best. So um, there's a few nodding heads in the audience, but I think that's because of probably some sleep deprivation. So, uh, so the message is get as much sleep as you possibly can. And, and we actually looked at sleep as part of my PhD way back in the day uh, in the simulated altitude tents, showing that um, with full laboratory sleep analysis, um, you see a respiratory disturbance in a small group of athletes. And so um, to compound the... Uh, the stress of altitude, we might also see sleep loss there in some, in some individuals. We also, uh, in the lead up to the 2020 Olympics, but actually going back to the, um, including athletes from the 47 athletes from 2008, 2010, 2012 Olympic teams, uh, we were able to compile a whole load of data together uh, using actigraphy, uh, which was very novel at the time. This was actually a really simple study that just pulls together data in athletes and compares them to healthy controls, showing that athletes tend to take longer to fall asleep, they tend to sleep for less time, and they tend to sleep with less efficiency. So, as I say, very simple study, but, but my most cited study. And others have explored all the different reasons why athletes might not sleep well. Uh, and it's the same kind of things. Um, lifestyle issues, social media, work uh, work balance but also the specific effects of training so uh, body temperature changes caused by by exercise um, and, and and so on and i'll just finish the sleep section just to just to talk briefly about um, an intervention and this is just a nice illustration of how when we um, initial when we find an athlete who's not sleeping well we can actually intervene quite easily asking them questions about their sleep giving them some advice and some education around how to sleep better and then, uh, and then measuring them again. And, and uh, Luke Edinburgh has just published this one in the Journal of Sports Sciences just to demonstrate that, that process. So the nice thing about sleep is that when you educate athletes on sleep, they tend to sleep better. And there's been numerous studies that have showed, have showed that process. Uh, there's one more here just on sleep that, again, shows the, 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 the kind of relentless drive of the human to, this is Rosie Stancer, who's done numerous extreme expeditions and some quite phenomenal, um, some quite phenomenal work. But in this example here, um, over 45 days, um, her sleep got less and less and less as she trekked to the, uh, to the South Pole solo. And she was able to continue, uh, the, the, the gap between these two is the length of the night's sleep. And for four or five nights in a row, she was getting less than one and a half hours of sleep a night and then getting up and trekking all day. So you can really push yourself into this red zone, if you like, into this danger zone with um, sleep loss if you choose to. Um, but her, she came back absolutely decimated from this, uh, from this trip. And so there's, uh, there's a, definitely a, um, an allostatic load associated with that. Um, we're doing some work with um, 
the military around sleep and recently we've been able to um, use those um, those t those uh, reaction tests I was talking about and documenting sleep the effects of sleep loss in uh, in the Navy and similar patterns we see uh, we see there also some work with the police um, so there's some uh, there's lots of different user groups that can uh, benefit from improved sleep. My final section you'll be pleased to know is around the role of the contemporary sports scientist and how that might have changed over the years and one of the things I, I wanted just to highlight that we documented recently was the rise of intravenous nutrition products. So this is athletes choosing to go and actually have a, a what's marketed to them as uh, nutrition delivered via a drip and you can, if you Google this, you, there's places over London where you could go and get your instant hangover cure by a, a drip or your, you know, the, the anti-aging uh, concoction and put it directly into your, into your uh, bloodstream. Now, I've talked a bit about the intricate mechanisms that we have in our guts and in our lungs and all parts of our body to prevent us from uh, being exposed to outside um, uh, foreign objects if you like well this is athletes choosing to put these largely unregulated uh, substances directly in, into their blood and it's potentially a um, a real issue going forwards but it illustrates the power of the internet the power of technology the power of marketing that now athletes are being uh, going away and thinking this is a good idea and they've got the right intentions it's not this isn't scandalous this is just stupidity you know you 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 don't need to go and uh, spend a load of money to put stuff directly into your blood that's going to actually um, probably put more of a stress on your physiology to actually filter out this stuff. Um, so um, I just wanted to put that up as a, as, a, um, as a bit of a case study here about how the role of the sports scientist has changed because looking out for this kind of thing I think is really important. So to, to finish up, I think... The contemporary sports scientist is really well positioned to help athletes achieve better health. And the first thing is like understanding the data that we collect. Um, so things like how does the data, you know, biological variation, measurement error, these type of things, how accurate is the data that we're collecting is hugely important. But equally as important these days is do you actually have rights to work with this data? Who's, who, uh, who is, who's got the... Um, consent to actually receive and work with the data is a, a, a really important issue. And if you have skills to model data and to, to produce really good quality insights from data, um, you're in a really good spot as a, uh, as a sports scientist. Part two is then communicating that to the athletes, the coaches, uh, the parents, the, the, the doctors. Um, and so I think that is an important skill for sports scientists, as it always has been. Um, Choosing the right things to measure and individualizing them, and then importantly, intervening where, where appropriate is, uh, sounds obvious, but it's uh, kind of uh, a crucial role of the sports scientist. And obviously goes hand in hand with the quality of that data that you're collecting. The next one is really education. So we've talked about sleep, we've talked about the menstrual cycle, we've talked about the importance of food and food first approaches, not intravenous drips and so there's a really important role for sports scientists to step in and educate on these areas to help athletes and, and their teams um, going forwards and actually keep them out of the clinic. Communication obviously goes hand in hand with that too. And then there's a couple of sort of big question marks over the the future like we've got now a, 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 a tsunami of data um, and we've got often athletes, the data itself becomes a stressor because they're over monitoring and they're over um, analyzing what they do. So we need to be careful there. On top of that, there's AI, which is giving us recovery metrics and you know, new um, you know, bits of feedback that's come out without necessarily understanding the whole picture. So we've got to say so the sports scientist needs to be in there filtering out that kind of information, making sure that the good quality information is reaching the athletes. And the final one is this fake news marketing. Like how do we get um, athletes away from the nonsense that's being fed to them directly through their, their phones? So that's the end of my talk. I wanted to, just before we take any questions, I just wanted to obviously 
I started making a slide trying to name all the people that I wanted to thank and it was just impossible. Uh, there's too many people around the world, uh, many important ones in the room here. So um, thank you obviously to all of those different people, but also uh, just, just to mention all the different um, funders and so on and, and collaborators that we have going on, um, not just me, but all the teams of people working on, on this work. Um, but obviously, given the occasion, I want to really thank St Mary's because you can see these amazing facilities that we've got here. And you'll see um, when you walk across the campus, hopefully for, for a drink afterwards. Um, but it's not just about the campus and the facilities, it's the people. And we've had, I've had amazing support from the technical, uh, from the technicians, from colleagues, from line managers over the years. And so I really want to call that out here. Finally, my family. And... I wouldn't be here with, without the support of Juliet and the boys, so, and my parents and everyone else, but really Juliet's the one holding everything together. So um, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much. Even though you went over time, sorry, still would get you some questions. So okay. I'll please ask the audience. Have a couple of questions if you have them. So anyone from the audience wants to address any questions about? Or we can go straight to the pub. Please. <laughs> <laughs> can I perhaps step the ball rolling? But before I do, I should declare an interest. I'm very much part of Team Pedler. <laughs> and in fact, um, Charlie's father-in-law. <laughs> um, and um, the other interest that I declare is the content of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some big, yeah, some big topics there. Um, in terms of the mental health, um, there's definitely been a big movement towards um, supporting athletes, recognising that they're humans, recognising that they're under immense pressure and, um, and trying to uh, capture mental health, quantify mental health in some way, and then um, and then address it. And it's certainly um, like I'm, I'm, I said, the brain was at the heart of all of those stress responses that we that we get that we have. Um, and repeatedly stressing the brain is going to end up not just in changes in behaviour and changes in mental health, but actually the physical qualities of the brain itself actually changes with this repeated stress. So we see a reduction in certain parts of the brain and where's Jasmine? Jasmine will be able to tell you all about that as a, as a, as a neurocognitive scientist over there. Um, so uh, things like ADHD coming from, um, from stress over a number of, uh, a number of years. So um, no, it's, a, it's a hugely important topic, not one that I'm well qualified to talk about at all, but this is I think we end up with these high level uh, frameworks with all these, you know, those triangles I mentioned, trying to capture so many different things. Um, all of those areas need their own lines of research, which is, you know, a massive amount of work. But one thing I did skim over is that is there two, um, two terms that I've learned just recently reading around allostatic load. One is equifinality, and that's that many different issues can lead to the same endpoint. So it might be that you become injured because you haven't been getting enough sleep or you're not taking on enough protein or you're not taking off enough energy or you've got a menstrual cycle problem, whatever it might be. There's also then this multi-finality where you have um, one stressor that can lead to a whole host of different outcomes. So also these are all longitudinal things uh, that happen over many, many weeks. So it's very hard to research them and set thresholds for all of these things to, to understand what's going on. So we have to spend a lot more time talking to people, finding out what's, what's going on, and I uh, don't know if that answers your question at all, Ian. <laughs> okay, One more question. Whitey. <sighs> I think... Uh, one, one thing I'm interested in is how we can, is this longitudinal thing? So we've got, we've got, a, uh, we've got a project going on at the moment with um, 
Harvard football, actually. So the NFL uh, have put a lot of money into working out because NFL players uh, are, um, and same with rugby, actually, there's, there's known long-term health implications of repeated hits. Um, also, um, the, the increasing size of these athletes. And so um, we're doing some work in collaboration with Aaron Bagish and the guys over in Boston to look at the, um, to look at the stresses in Korea and if we can try to not just look at a single inflammation marker at the beginning of the season and one at the end, what's happening day to day? And so you, that kind of area under the curve of stress uh, that might be leading to, um, to long-term health issues. And that's really trying to capture this allostatic load thing that I've been going on about. Uh, on the female athlete side, hugely exciting. We've got um, several PhDs looking at things like the impact of, uh, of uh, ethnicity, uh, looking at uh, nutrition on symptoms, looking at sleep. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch of work going on there too. So, so much to do, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Before we join Charlie, I'm just going to say that university staff, especially the staff, and it's always a, as a chief academic officer, it's always a, a, a pride moment to actually compare some of the professors here. And a person on Lord's Day said, Child, thank you very much for sticking with St. Mary's and being someone who contributes to the research ethos, to the development of the research environment, supporting PhD students. It's an honor to have you as a professor here. So thank you very much. Thank you. And everyone, please join me in congratulating Child. <laughs> Yeah, well. But, or can we take people there and you can spend some time? Yes, the please. Uh, please. And if anybody wants to actually walk through the labs and see the, the biomechanics lab and the physiology lab on their way through, they can do. Otherwise, going back out the way uh, you came in, it's fine too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, chaps. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Why was it that? I liked it. I liked it. Yeah. Who's on the treadmill? Yeah. What's this? It's a microphone. Can I turn it on? I should probably take it off. When were you doing that? Is it on?